Hello students, so this video is the English comprehension section of your mock test 250-2303. The section has 25 questions, most of which are uh, related to the usage of words, the uh, context in which you would use words, what uh, the sort of skills that we normally expect people to have to be able to understand what they read. So you do get these question types in your your test so the mock test takes you through those question types 25 of them so we're not discussing inputs in this uh, video we're not discussing grammar rules or vocabulary development we are looking at the questions and trying to work out the contextual relevance of the words and figure out the answer also recognize the meaning other meanings of the word the meanings of the other words given so that you know what they are and you would not make mistakes with them okay so let's get started then the first of the questions is one that looks at synonym of word. The word given to you here is malodorous and you know that if you just pay attention to it, even if you hadn't seen the word before, if you look at the word odor, you know odor means smell. And then you realize that mal, normally when we use, we use the prefix mal for any word, it normally means bad. So malodorous would mean something having a bad smell, an adjective for something having a bad smell. So we want a synonym for something having a bad smell. Now it can't be fragrant because fragrant is actually pleasant smell. Noxious is very unpleasant or harmful. Insipid is something that has no effect at all. So you have no, I mean it's neither positive nor negative. It has no taste, it has no smell. So something is actually without smell at all would be insipid. Savory could be something that is pleasant to uh, smell. I mean, it's not sweet, but it is a sort of spicy um, sort of smell that we all enjoy. So that would be savory. So fragrant and savory are both positive words, whereas what you want is a negative word. Insipid is not a negative word because in this case it says that there is no smell at all. So the word you're looking at is noxious. Noxious does normally mean harmful, but noxious can also be used to mean very, very unpleasant. Okay, so the answer here would be very, very unpleasant or noxious. Let's remember the other meanings here. Fragrant is sweet smelling. Savory is interesting smelling. Insipid is having no smell. And noxious would be having unpleasant or bad smells. So that would be the synonym of malodorous. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Now this is actually about a sentence where we are looking at idiomatic use that means grammatical structure of a sentence with let us say traditional use of words and the underlying portion you have to consider whether it is actually correct or if it needs to be corrected with any of the choices provided so we have clearly lost the plot we have clearly lost the plot as far as accountability of science to society is concerned and need to make some course correction now, to lose the plot is actually an idiom that means that we have lost direction. We don't know where we are going. We have no idea what we are doing. And the usage actually is quite okay here because we have, per present perfect tense, clearly lost the plot, which means as of now, at present, we have no idea about how to connect science to society or make science accountable to society. So, we have clearly lost the plot is actually a correct use and therefore you have no improvement needed. It can't be we are clearly lost the plot. It can't be we are clearly lost the plot because lost you lose the plot that means you have clearly lost the plot. So clearly is only an adverb. So basically we are saying we have lost the plot. So I said to lose the plot is to actually lose direction. So there is no improvement needed in this sentence. So two the answer would be choice. The next question looks at a one word substitute for an entire phrase. So you are given a meaning and you have to identify the word that corresponds to that meaning. So it is basically the test, uh, test of your recognition of words in their context. So when you talk about moral or cultural decline as characterized by excessive indulgence in pleasure or luxury, which means you find people or society or people engaging a great deal in pleasure or luxury and that indicates that they are actually losing their value. 
they're losing their moral values or their cultural values. Now the word for that, moral or cultural decline, has character the excessive indulgence. So what's really happening is that if there's moral or cultural decline, it means that morally or culturally society is decaying. You know the word decay, correct? D E C A Y. So if society is decaying, then it's in a state of decadence. So the word you want here is decadence, right? So decadence is the state of moral or cultural decay. And typically that is when you recognize that people are paying too much attention to pleasure or luxury and are losing moral or ethical values, then society is in a state of decadence. So society is decaying. So the answer here would be decadence. Now what is desertion? Desertion is to abandon a responsibility. So where you have a responsibility and that responsibility could be anything. You could have a responsibility as a soldier, as an administrator, as a parent, as a teacher. And if you actually uh, abandon your responsibilities and run, abandon your responsibilities and go away, then you have deserted your responsibility. So desertion is the state of abandonment of your responsibility. Dissension. Now, to dissent, to dissent is to disagree. So when people engage in dissent, it means they do not agree with other people. So dissension is a state of disagreement. So when you say that the the meeting, uh, let's say, was reduced to a state of dissension, it means everybody was disagreeing with each other. So that would be dissension. What about distortion? Well, distortion means to uh, change the shape of something and make it wrong. So to distort something is to give it a wrong shape or to give it a twisted shape or to take it out of recognizable shape. That is to distort. So distortion is where something is changed in its, is transformed in its shape to something that is incorrect or to something that is wrong. Okay. So that's distortion. So the answer to three would be decadence where moral or cultural values are in a state of decay. Okay. Let's look at four. To put one's shirt on something. Okay. So that dot dot there would mean that you put your shirt on something. To put your shirt on something is is uh, like taking a bet on something. When you take a bet on something, it means you are prepared to risk what you have. So to put your shirt on something is to actually risk everything you have on something that you want to undertake. So if somebody were to put one's shirt on the promise somebody has made, then it means you are risking everything for the promise somebody has made. So here it's not the usual idiom here is to bet your shirt on something but then you also have the idiom that says to put one shirt on so to put your shirt on something is to risk everything for that so it's not only to wear a shirt it's not to run to save someone it's not to be prepared always it's to actually risk everything for something that you want to carry out or you want to do or you want to get okay so that is to put your shirt on something is that to risk everything let's look at question five this one is again if there is no error then your choice is four but otherwise one of these parts may have an error so the sentence is divided into three parts and you have to ask whether or you have to check whether each of those parts is correct if any one part is wrong then you identify the part that's wrong and mark that as the answer but if all the parts are correct and the sentence makes sense and is grammatically accurate then you would say there is no error there is more gratification for being a caring person than in just being a nice person. In other words, it means you find satisfaction when you are a caring person and more than when you are just a nice person. So there is more satisfaction or there is more gratification in being. It can't be for being. Okay. So the preposition after gratification would be there is more gratification in being a caring person because it's like using the, if you were to substitute it with the word satisfaction for instance you would say there is more satisfaction in being a caring person so in being a caring person than in just being a nice person so the error here is in two because two requires in not for okay so this needs to be in what is gratification in this context gratification actually is satisfaction or feeling of satisfaction that you get okay so two is the part that has an error in this case. Let's look at question 6. Question 6 again looks at is the underlying portion erroneous and if it is erroneous then what would you, if it has an error then what would you substitute it with or if you think that it has no error then you would say no improvement required. 
developing on this which means we have a previous idea and then taking that idea forward or expanding that idea developing on this we need to blend the emerging entrepreneurial ecosystem with centers of excellence in higher education and soon we will be a nation transformed now soon we will be but the fact is we need to blend now if you say we need to blend it means that's a condition we have to make for ourselves we have to bring about that change and if we bring about that change the transformation will follow correct so since we are looking at a condition there it can't be we will no it won't be we should because that talks about responsibility it doesn't talk about only capability which is we could it talks about what will happen if a particular condition were to come about and therefore you use we would so do remember that should could and would are all conditional statements but should is responsibility under some condition could is capability under some condition whereas would is determination under some condition so we would be a nation transformed is the certainty if a particular condition exists but let's also so the answer here is 3 but let's also understand what the sentence says so there is some previous idea okay and developing on that idea we need to blend the emerging entrepreneurial ecosystem what do you mean by that so entrepreneurial would mean people who are willing to start businesses they are entrepreneurs ecosystem is the entire system where new businesses are allowed to develop that means the support system for new businesses the new businesses themselves the government support provided to them the financial support that that's the ecosystem there so we're not talking about the ecology in the sense of the environment we're talking about the ecology in the sense of the business environment so we need to blend the emerging entrepreneurial ecosystem that means this growing system of business with centers of excellence in higher education that means you actually have to connect new ideas in business with uh, higher education so that people can actually bring their ideas from education into development and into innovation etc so when that happens we will actually see a major change in our nation okay and soon we would be a nation transformed fine so answer to 6 would be 3 transformed would mean where something is changed completely or is changed substantially correct now let's look at 7 you want the incorrectly spelled word in 7 okay now the incorrectly spelled word uh pulmonary p u l m o n a r y pulmonary is to do with the lungs so anything to do with the lungs is pulmonary and therefore there's nothing wrong with the spelling okay So pulmonology is the study of the lungs. A pulmonologist is a doctor who actually treats uh, lung diseases, and pulmonary is the adjective to do with lungs. Okay, aorta. Now the aorta is one of the vessels that goes into the heart. Correct? Connects the heart to the lungs. So aorta is spelled correctly. A O R T A. Femoral. Okay. Now you don't need F A E M O R A L. Okay. So the spelling is wrong in femoral because that. is not correct but you don't need a in there and bronchial is to do with the bronchial uh, let us say um, cells in your lung so your your cells have little little bunches of your lungs have little bunches of cells called bronchi and what are the effects the bronchi or to do with the bronchi would be referred to as bronchial okay so that spelling is correct femoral is the wrong spelling The spelling actually is femoral. You don't need a e; it is only f e m o r a l. Okay. So the femoral artery is also an artery. It's also an artery that carries blood out of the out of the heart. So the aorta and the femoral are all arteries. So are the pulmonary. Right. So basically, all four here are actually names of particular arteries. And arteries are the vessels that carry blood out of your heart. Okay. So femoral is wrong. It needs to be f e m o r a l. and then again we come down to a question in 8 which is a one word substitute for the entire group of words which means the whole meaning in one word so a person or thing that comes before another of the same kind so a forerunner or an ancestor or a pioneer or something that comes before something else isn't it a person or thing that comes before another of the same kind so what would you have over here now it's not survivor because a survivor is one that 
is able to last in spite of some disaster so even through a disaster somebody actually stays alive or something lasts then that's a survivor it's not one that comes before a simulator a simulator is something that makes it possible to turn out something similar to something else so simulator makes something similar to something else so presents something that could be similar to something else we are talking about what comes before another precursor now precursor is that so something that indicates what will follow or something that shows you what will follow or something that comes first and then something will follow like an ancestor that would be a precursor okay so the answer here would be precursor progeny progeny is actually child so the next generation of parents would be progeny so people's progeny are their children their grandchildren etc the following the generation that follow one generation would be the progeny okay so progeny is not the word you want so here you need precursor and if we go down to question 9 again we have segments and you have to identify which segment actually has an error over here there is no possibility of no error so that means one or the other of these segments actually has an error so let's read the whole sentence relationships relationships are built in kindness understanding and self sacrifice that means we are saying that the basis of a relationship is kindness or understanding or self sacrifice if that's the basis then you can't say relationships are built in kindness we we'll actually say relationships are built on kindness right so it likely have to be relationships are built on kindness understanding and self sacrifice not on jealousy selfishness puffed up egos and rude behavior so you need on here and not in and therefore the second part has an error all right now you do understand what the sentence means isn't it a relationship needs to have good basis and what would that basis be it needs to have good and valuable basis and what would that valuable basis be well that basis could be kindness it could be understanding it could be self sacrifice but it can't be negative basis like jealousy and selfishness and ego and rude behavior so that's what the sentence means and the correction that you need is in the second part they are built in kindness understanding and self sacrifice let's look at question 10 this is an idiom again i would give my right arm to meet my favorite actor now the idiom i would give my right arm would mean it is a great desire i have i would actually i would like very much to do that uh in fact i'm prepared to take some trouble to do it as well of course it's not the trouble is not the trouble is not as far as actually giving your arm but yeah i would i would actually extend myself a bit i take some trouble i'd even wait if i had to wait uh because it is something that i'd like to very much it's a very keen desire so i would give my right arm would mean i have a very keen desire that's what it means so to like something very much okay to support someone without any reservation it's not to support someone here the person wants to meet to fight for something at full strength no the to meet tells you it's not about fighting for something to be ready to sacrifice anything for someone no if that was sacrifice you'd say i'd give my right arm for my favorite actor which means i would sacrifice anything for my favorite actor but if i give my right arm to meet it means i would very much like to meet my favorite actor so in this context i would give my right arm to meet would mean i would like very much to meet. so normally i would give my right arm as an idiom to mean i desire something uh greatly okay so answer to 10 would be one let's look at 11 so this is about picking a passive voice statement so you take the active voice which is given to us and then in which manner would the passive voice be done don't forget what happens with passive voice with passive voice so in active voice the doer is the subject of the sentence in passive voice the action or the receiver is the subject of the sentence right so the action or the result is the subject of the sentence so we need to convert this where the subject to the sentence becomes the receiver or the result or the doer or the action and the doer moves down to the end of the sentence okay so abhijit will take meghna for the photo shoot so abhijit is doing what he's taking meghna so it actually if the result has to be meghna was taken so it has to start with meghna so let's look at what the sentence say 
Meghna would be taken for the photo shoot by Abhijit. Would be taken. But we are not saying Abhijit will take Meghna for the photo shoot if some condition exists. There is no condition here. So we don't need to say Meghna would be taken. Meghna is taken? No, we are looking at the future. We are talking about will take. So that's future. So we can't say Meghna is taken. Meghna will be taken? That's right. Because when you say Abhijit will take Meghna, then you say Meghna will be taken by Abhijit for the photo shoot. So that's right. Now what's the difference between 1 and 3? Well, 1 talks about would be taken, that is subject to a certain condition. And we are not giving you the basic statement with the condition. We are saying Abhijit will take and therefore it will be Meghna will be taken. Meghna is being taken is present continuous. So we don't need that. We are looking at the future. So Meghna will be taken by Abhijit for the photo shoot. Let's look at the first one. The first one is a conditional future, but there is no condition here. The second one is present tense, but we are talking about future tense. The fourth one is present continuous tense, but we are talking about future tense. So, Meghna will be taken. So, 11, the answer would be 3. What about 12? Again, you need active voice this time, which means the statement is given to you in passive voice, and you've got to convert it to active. Now the statement says, my house is being kept tidy by my maid servant. Now we realize that what we talked about earlier is the passive voice is where the result or the action is the subject of the sentence and the doer comes down later. So my house is being kept tidy. By whom? By my maid servant. So in other words, the doer here is the maid servant. So it will have to be my maid servant, right? Now is being kept tidy. Is being kept would mean present continuous tense. So that means that is something that is ongoing on an everyday basis, present continuous tense. So even the active voice would actually have to be in present continuous tense. So my maid servant is keeping my house tidy, is present continuous tense. So that works. My maid servant keeps my house tidy. Now that is simple present tense. So if I were to look at it that way, the passive voice would be my house is kept tidy by. So if I say my house is kept tidy by, then you say my maid servant keeps my house tidy. But here we are saying my house is being kept tidy, so we need continuous tense even in the active voice. So my maid servant is keeping my house tidy. That's the correct one. The second one is active voice for simple present tense. The third one is active voice for future tense. My maid servant will keep my house tidy. And the fourth one is past perfect tense. Active voice for past perfect tense. My maid servant had kept my house tidy. So that's past tense. So we're looking at present continuous tense. My maid servant is keeping my house tidy. So 12, the answer would be 1. 13. Here we are looking at vocabulary again. And you need the antonym of the given word. An antonym is an opposite. So you need to know what the word means to be able to pick up what the opposite is. So who's a psychophant? A psychophant is a person who is totally uh, subservient to someone else who says that you are my lord you are my master I will do whatever you want you know I'll lick your boots if you want you know, st stuff like that now that is a psychophant a person who follows somebody else blindly with total devotion without even thinking about without even being reasonable about it that such a person would be a psychophant so we want an antonym we want an antonym now a psychophant is a complete follower so the antonym would have to be someone who doesn't follow it would have to be someone who doesn't follow so someone who protests someone who resists that would be the opposite so it can't be adulator because an adulator is a person who holds someone in adulation who admires somebody greatly so that's close enough to being a psychophant in some time in some context detractor that's right so a detractor is somebody who criticizes somebody who differs with someone else Okay, somebody who is who presents contrary thought. So detractor certainly is not a person who wants to do what the other person wants. A detractor is not a person who is flattering somebody. And so for, therefore that's your opposite then. So that would be the antonym. A brown noser. Well, this is an American term. A brown noser is a person who is also a psychophant, who simply flatters people. A lickspittle is, I mean, in fact, brown noser and lickspittle are very rude terms don't normally use them but uh, they both mean people who will actually bow and scrape and curry favor with somebody else okay i think i think you know what lickspittle means you 
we know what lick means and spittle means spit. So that's a very extreme word. So adulator is someone who holds somebody in great affection. Brown noser and lick spittle are people who are totally, uh, let us say, captivated by and obsessed by somebody else. But what you want is an opposite, so detractor is going to be the opposite. So 13, the answer would be 2. 14, you need indirect speech here. So we've got direct speech and you need to convert that to indirect speech. So Rakesh asked Ramya, can you dance? So you need to remove the quotes and put it down as an indirect speech statement. So it will actually have to be, Rakesh asked Ramya whether she could dance. Isn't it? So Rakesh asked Ramya, can you dance? So you really need whether she could dance. Rakesh asked Ramya whether she could dance. I don't have whether here, but I do have if. And we do sometimes use if the way we use whether. Isn't it? So it can't be Rakesh asked Ramya to dance. It can't be Rakesh asked Ramya if you can dance because that doesn't make it indirect speech. It would be Rakesh asked Ramya if she could dance. And here the if is very much like weather. Okay? W-H-E-T-H-E-R. So this is your is this is your indirect speech form. Rakesh asked Ramya whether she could dance or if she could dance. It's not Rakesh asked Ramya when she could dance. It's not about when she could dance. It is about whether she could dance. Does she has the ability? So whether she could dance or if she could dance. Okay. So 14, the answer is 3. What about 15? Now, if you look at the others, you realize Rakesh asked Ramya to dance is he asked her to do something. Rakesh asked Ramya if you could dance. No, if he asked, if he asked Ramya, then if you could dance, you won't bring the word you in unless you're using direct speech. And the last one, Rakesh asked Ramya when she could dance is about when she could dance. That means he's actually asking her a question about at what time can I actually see you dance. That's a different thing, right? So here, Rakesh asked Ramya if she could dance. Do remember that you can also use the word weather over here. W-H-E-T-H-E-R. So 14, the answer is 3. Now here, in 15, we have a parajumble. Now in the parajumble, in this particular case, we are given choices. So even if you are able to work out a couple of links or recognize a couple of links, you can probably use that to be able to look at the choices and work out what the sequence is. But whatever you do, it's always important to read all four sentences completely. Finish all four sentences, get a sense of links, but also understand what the overall context is likely to be. And then using both those recognitions, the links and the context, you can work out what the sequence is. So. The populous revolt of our day reflects the deep rift that has opened between the worldview of the global intellectual and professional elites and that of ordinary citizens. Now this is a very general statement. It says that the populous revolt of our day, right, which means the, uh, the common person is actually against whom, is against the intellectuals and the professional elites. So that revolt shows the deep difference. Rift is a gap a space, a difference, the deep rift that has opened between the perspective, worldview is the outlook or the perspective of the intellectual and professional lights and the perspective of ordinary citizens. So we know what the context is. This is an opening context that says the populist revolt shows us that the ordinary citizens have a very different view of the world as compared to the global intellectual and professional lights. Okay. So A is, it is possible to consider that this paragraph could start with A because it seems like a very general statement. But let's just put A there. B, proposed remedies among mainstream thought leaders rarely go beyond an invocation of the problem of inequality and a bit more focus on compensating the loser. Uh, loser. Now, if you say proposed remedy, you have to talk about some problem that we have. Now, A hasn't yet talked about a problem. It has said that there's a difference between people. But the difference could lead to a problem, correct? So that means B is not going to come directly after A. Obviously, having said there's a difference, you have to in introduce or the thought that this leads to a problem. And then remedies can only be once you have discussed the problem. So B can't be coming directly after A. Now C is, yet the intellectual consensus that brought us to the chasm remains intact. Now you have to understand that what that means. 
The chasm is this rift. The word rift, which means a great divide, is the same thing as chasm, which also means a great divide. And you're saying, yet the intellectual consensus that brought us to the chasm remains intact, which means what started the problem is still there. What started the division is still there. Now, if what started the division is still there, then we do have a problem. So we know that C and B actually work together. Because when you say the intellectual consensus that brought us to this chasm remains intact, and then propose remedies among mainstream thought leaders rarely go beyond indication. That means this intellectual consensus that brought us to this point remains a problem, and the proposed remedies hardly go beyond just talking. They just talk, and they compensate the losers a bit more, but they don't really solve the problem. That means proposed remedies aren't really solving the problem. So that means C and B actually work together. Now, if C and B work together, then you know I have only one choice here because CB as a sequence appears only in choice 4, which means it has to be choice 4, which is ABCB. But once you work that out, just read the thing in that sequence and see whether it makes sense. So let's look at that. The populist revolt of our day reflects the deep rift that has opened between the worldview of the global intellectual and professional elites and that of ordinary citizens. These two groups, and you know that A and D are definitely connected then, because these two groups are the global intellectual, and I mean the professional, the elites, and then the ordinary citizens. These two groups now live in parallel social worlds. So the elites have one world, and parallelly the ordinary citizens have a different world, and orient themselves using different cognitive maps, which means they run their lives with different perspectives. Correct? And you know that the perspective is that there are different worldviews that they have, which means they have different perspectives. A cognitive map is how I want to deal with my world, which is my perspective then. So these two groups live in parallel social worlds, which two groups, the elites and then the ordinary citizens. So we know that A and D work together. We know that C and D work together. So A, D, C, B would be the sequence. So let's just read it then. So the populist revolt exists. These two groups now live in parallel social worlds and orient themselves using different perspectives. But the consensus that brought us to the chasm remains intact. The intellectual consensus that brought us to this uh, problem is still there. And what remedies people propose don't do much at all. They don't, they simply talk about inequality and they focus on compensation, but they don't really solve the problem. So that's ADCB for you. Okay, so 15, the answer would be Let's look at 16. Here we're looking at a synonym again. Now the word flak, the word flak means criticism. Now typically, okay, so let's just remember what this is. Flak is actually a military term. So when, you know, when uh, aircraft came into uh, use in war, then people developed guns to shoot at aircraft. So they call them anti-aircraft guns. And the shells that were shot into the air would explode in the air and the pilots who were flying the planes would try very hard to avoid those shells. Now, the shells that were exploding in the air were being referred to as flak. So, in, for the Air Force, flak is an exploding shell in the air, the shell having been fired at a passing aeroplane. So, that word has been taken into conversation to mean extreme criticism. So, flak, when, you, when somebody faces flak, it means somebody is facing extreme criticism. So that's what the word means. So the most appropriate synonym here would actually be criticism. Okay. So if I were to criticize somebody thoroughly, then I'm giving that person flak or that person is facing flak. Okay. Concealed would mean hidden. We know that. Concise would mean brief. We know that. Creative is being able to turn out new things. Okay. So those are the meanings of that. The word you want is criticism. Question 17 is a sentence that has four parts and one of these parts has an error. The four parts are given to you in the choices. So you identify which part has an error and pick that as the choice. When parties meet to negotiate, they, so parties plural, they plural, they comes with certain parameters. It can't be come because comes is singular. You'll actually have to have a plural. So it will have to be they come with certain parameters. Okay. So they come with certain parameters and limitations in mind to achieve the possible outcome. So the error here is going to be in two. What does the sentence mean? 
So when parties meet to negotiate, which means when they want to talk and come to some agreement, they do come to that meeting with some standards that they have in mind, some constraints, some limitations, some limits that they have in mind, some boundaries they have in mind. And within those standards and those boundaries, they want to get the best possible outcome. Okay, So that is what the sentence means. So the error is in two where you need come and not comes. Okay, So that's question 17. What? Okay, so question 18 here has four bits and one of these bits actually has an error. So we identify which bit has the error. So software technology parks in the 1980s and 1990s enabled industry to import equipment at competitive prices, avail themselves tax holidays and access free connectivity to the internet. Now basically we are talking about the fact that these software technology parks made something possible. What did they make possible? They made it possible for industry to import equipment, to benefit from tax holidays and to access free connectivity to the internet. That means to actually use free connectivity. So that means over here I'm using the word avail in the sense of to draw benefit, right? Or to gain benefit, to gain the benefit of something. So when you talk about to gain the benefit of something, you'd say avail tax holiday. You wouldn't say avail themselves. Because when you say avail themselves, you're actually saying, so he availed. Now, when you say avail themselves of something, it means to actually be able to reach it. But here we are saying they got the benefit of. So if, since you're only saying they got the benefit of, we don't need the word themselves over here. So it will be a whale tax holidays. So it enables them to import equipment. One word. A whale tax holidays. So know themselves. A whale tax holidays. The next uh, benefit. And access free connectivity. So that means we are looking at three benefits here. One is the benefit of importing equipment. The other one is availing tax holidays. And the other one is accessing free connectivity to the internet. So that means three is wrong here because you don't actually need the themselves. Okay, so that's the error in 18. Now we move to 19. The incorrectly spelled word. Now the four words here, anyone who has some familiarity with the army knows that these are all ranks that officers have in the army. And if you paid some attention to the newspapers, for instance, you know the spellings of these words. Now we know that kernel, the spelling, the pronunciation is kernel, but the spelling is correct, C-O-L-O-N-E-L. We don't say colonel, we say kernel. And the second one is lieutenant, and even though we say lieutenant, it is actually spelled L-I-E-U-T, so that's right. But captain, of course, we are very familiar with that word. And then you have a brigadier, but the brigadier is B-R-I-G-A-D-I-E-R. Okay, so this is your own spelling, it actually has to be N-E. So the first three are right, one, two, and three. They are all ranks and they are all correctly spelled. The fourth one needs to be brigadier with a D-I-E-R. So four is your error in question 19. Coming down to question 20, you want the antonym of the word impetuous. Antonym would mean the opposite. Okay. Now what does the word impetuous mean? The word impetuous means doing things suddenly and without much thought. That means doing things simply because in a hurry, because you're angry, because you're emotional and without really thinking about it. That's when someone is impetuous. That means acting without thinking, right? Let's put it that way. Acting without thinking is impetuous. So if people actually act with some thinking, if they're careful about what they're doing, then that would be the opposite. Okay? So what would that be? Circumspect. Now the word circumspect actually means being very careful. So when you're circumspect, you actually consider things carefully before you do anything. So impetus is thinking or acting hastily without much thought. Whereas circumspect would be when you present a lot of thought before you do something. So that would be your antonym here. Okay. The word rampant would mean something that is spreading very fast and very aggressively. Okay. That is rampant. Impulsive is in some sense like impetus. Impetus is without any thought, whereas impulsive is driven by emotion. So when people are impulsive, it means that they act suddenly and they are basically prompted by their emotion. Imprudent is not being careful at all. Imprudent actually means being careless. Okay. So the opposite here would be circumspect, circumspect which means being really careful before you do anything. So 20, the answer would be 1. 21. 
Okay, so 21 to 25, this is what we call a closed passage. Now, closed passage is a complete paragraph and it has various blanks. This one has five blanks. And the idea is to pick the words that fit the blanks, keeping in mind the context not only of each sentence, but the context of the entire paragraph itself. Okay, so you pay attention to that. And with that context, you recognize what the word could be. So sometimes even, I mean, it, you really wouldn't want to read one sentence to go down to the question straight away. It's good to read the entire paragraph so that you get a sense of what the person is trying to say. And then you get some idea of what kind of thought goes into the blanks. And then you can fill the choices or you can pick from the choices without too much of a problem. So the 19th century pessimist philosopher. And a pessimist philosopher is a philosopher who looked at things as if there was no hope. We know that. Schopenhauer was notorious for preaching dash futurity of desire. So if he was a pessimist, now we know what futurity is. Futility is where something is useless. Where something is useless, then you say it is futile. So this person obviously was preaching that desire is useless. So you shouldn't have desire. So obviously when you are already saying futility, then you need an adjective for that futility. So it has to be the absolute futility, utter futility, something like that. And then it explains that getting what you want could fail to make you happy would not have surprised him at all. So he was a pessimist. And when, if he knew that people couldn't get what they want, and that, uh, you know, that, uh, sorry, he, as a pessimist, he recognized even if you get what you want, he, people don't are not happy. That wouldn't surprise him because he thinks that desire is futile. On the other hand, not having it is just as bad. On the other hand, not getting what you want is also bad. So when you get what you want, you're not happy, that is bad. And when you don't get what you want, that's also bad because you still want it. So that's why he says desire is futile. So for Schopenhauer, you are damned if you do and damned if you don't, which means you're, there's an equally negative effect on you if you get what you want. There's an equally negative effect on you if you don't get what you want. If you get what you want, your dash is over. What is the dash? That means your desire is met, your pursuit is over, your journey is finished. If your journey is over, then you are dash. That means you are empty. You don't have an objective anymore. So if you get what you want, your journey is over. We understand that 22 has to be something like journey. And then you are empty. You have no further aim. You are aimless. Flooded with fearful emptiness and boredom, as he put it in this book. Life needs direction, desires, projects, goals that are so far unachieved. That means life actually needs you to keep looking at something that you want to gain. Keep looking at some direction. And yet this too is uh, dash. This too. Now the two is because he says desire is futile. And therefore having direction or hoping for direction in projects and goals. This too is dash. That means that too is also futile in some sense. So I need a word like futile there. Because wanting what you do not have is suffering. Because if you have desires and projects and goals that aren't achieved, then you suffer until you get them, according to this pessimist philosopher. In staving off the void by finding things to do, that means in filling your life or the, making sure that your life is not empty, by finding things to do, you have condemned yourself to dash misery. That means you've given yourself jobs that you have to keep fulfilling. So according to him, that is also bad. So life swings like a pendulum to and fro between pain and boredom. And these two are in fact its ultimate constituents. So this person's end result was that life is only pain on one side, boredom on the other side and everything in between. So whichever way you go, you're either going to be suffering or you're going to be bored, both of which are negative. Now don't take this very seriously, okay? This is somebody's thought that they're giving to you in a paragraph. You're not to be influenced by it. But you do understand what the person is trying to say. Okay, so since we have some rough idea of what the whole passage, says, the whole paragraph says, then we can look at the choices and arrive at a particular choice. So, we realize that he was notorious. Notorious is he had this bad reputation, correct? So, he had this reputation for preaching that desire was useless and you need absolute or complete or whatever it is for 21. So, what do we have for 21? We have Okay, so 21 is not even about an adjective. It actually is asking whether you want an article or not. So do we need for preaching a futurity or the futurity or an futurity? No, you don't. Isn't it? Now, if you say the futurity, it can't be a futurity of desire. That's a specific futurity of many. 
it can't be an futurity of desire but it could be the futurity of desire that means desire is futile and that is always going to be the case so as far as he is concerned the futility of desire that means desire is futile and he refers to that situation as the futility of desire fine so we need the in that case so we know that 21 the answer would be the the futility of desire okay then moving back we realize that if you get what you want your dash is over and we know that your journey is over okay if your journey is over or your search is over then what is it that you want so your quest is your search but you are moving towards it you realize we actually thought about the fact that you are chasing something you have a desire it's not just a search you have a desire there's something you already want and therefore you are working towards it which means you will have a you engage in a journey to get it so in some sense you are chasing it you are seeking it and therefore it's not merely a quest a quest only means a search it's not a tussle a tussle means a struggle it's not a wrangle because that means a struggle as well it's a pursuit you're pursuing that objective and that pursuit is futile okay so we know that the word has to be pursued then going back to 23 if you so you are dash flooded with a fearful emptiness so if you get what you want and your pursuit is over then thereafter you have no aim no objective in some sense you are empty so what do you want so since you have when we know it is that you have no objective or no aim then it has to be aimless so you are aimless is what you want it can't be you are intimidated because intimidated intimidated means that you are in fear because you are being threatened not languid because languid would be very relaxed and very lethargic not apathetic because that means without any feelings at all so what you want here is you are left aimless without any objective correct you see it works over there so what you say is that if you get what you want your pursuit is over you are aimless flooded with a fearful emptiness and boredom fine and then he says life needs direction desires project goals etc and yet this too is problematic this too is futile isn't it so this too is what so this too is if you say detrimental detrimental only means that it has a negative impact this too is fatal would mean this too is going to cause you uh, sorrow it's going to cause you suffering you can't use fortuitous because fortuitous fortuitous means uh, lucky so we are not talking about it being lucky deplorable is when you strongly criticize something no we are not talking about criticizing anything we are talking about being in a state of suffering that's what we understand isn't it and so the word would actually have to be fatal so you're going to be left in a situation that is fatal or that's going to leave you in a state of suffering detrimental is only about something that has a negative impact that means it can reduce the benefits that you get we're not talking about simply reducing benefits that you get we're talking about leaving you in a state of suffering so that would actually have to be fatal and that brings us to 25 because 25 sorry so 25 asks what so it says because wanting what you do not have is suffering in staving off the void by finding things you do you have condemned yourself to a life of misery right you condemned yourself to suffering you condemned yourself to misery so what do we have at 25 we are offered prepositions so right you need the word to so you condemned yourself to misery so to would be the answer to that okay so that finishes the 25 questions we have here the english segment of your test do remember that some of these might not have been terribly easy but most of them were easy if you have a decent reading habit do remember that your preparation i know that your preparation of course is about going through the practice material that you get going through all the uh, study material that you have but all this also has to be supplemented with a good and regular reading habit because the more you read the more you come across the way people use words the more you come across proper structures and sentences and it becomes familiar to you and basically with familiarity handling these questions or these kinds of questions becomes very very easy so please remember along with all your preparation also keep reading make sure that you supplement your preparation with a reading habit and watch out for new words watch out watch out for uh, construction in long sentences so that they become familiar okay so that's how you tackle these things all the best and thank you